If you were to be able to jump back in time and meet the teenage Ken, what would you say to Ken in his teenage years? I was always open-minded, but I think I was a bit judgmental. And I don't know why, but I was open-minded to the friends I had, the things I did. But I also think that perhaps I was too easily deciding on what was right, what was wrong, what was good, what was bad. And, and I learned over time that things aren't black and white, they're much more gray than that. So the advice I would give is relax a little bit if you can. Maybe relax a little bit more and, and, and just accept things a little bit more. My name's Dr. Gary Crotez, and I'm a coach, podcaster, and award-winning author of The Idea Mindset, a book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. When I'm in conversation with my coaching clients, these are the breakthroughs that are so profound that they remember vividly where they were, who they were with, what they were thinking when their unlock moment happened. In this podcast, I'll be meeting and learning about people who have accomplished great things or brought about significant change in their life. And you'll be meeting them with me. We'll be finding out what inspired them, how they got through the hard times and what they learned along the way that they can share with you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast to hear all about another Unlock Moment. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to another episode of the Unlock Moment podcast. Now, there are many reasons why I knew that today's guest would be someone you'd really enjoy learning from, not least the title of his most recent book, Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers Adventures in Global Business. Ken Pasternak has a unique background that combines executive education, keynote speaking, management consulting, institution building, and corporate banking. Like me, he started out on a path to medicine, but pivoted into a very different career. Prior to his more than 25 years advising and teaching business leaders around the world, Ken was director at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and before that, a vice president at Citibank, while based in six countries. Ken focuses on building high-performance organizations through visionary leadership, team effectiveness, creating a winning culture and improving cross-cultural understanding. Still a keen world traveler, he's taught at business schools around the world and splits his time between Florida and Helsinki. Ken has a particular interest in Formula One. He co-authored a book entitled Performance at the Limit, Business Lessons from Formula One Motor Racing, which sparked an eight-part BBC World television series called Formula for Success. I'm looking forward to hearing his take on what the rarefied world of Formula One can teach us about achieving success in leadership and in life. And of course, to hear about the unlocked moments of remarkable clarity that helped him to navigate the straits, the chicanes and the unscheduled pit stops of his own life journey. Ken Pasternak, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Unlock Moment. Thank you, Gary. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Well, I can't wait to find out more about the exploding turkeys and the spare trousers. But maybe to set this all in context, tell us, where do we need to start in your story to understand the person you are today? Well, you alluded to perhaps the starting point by mentioning that we both shared an early path towards medicine. You went much further and actually became a doctor. I uh, started on that path and uh, decided to change. Growing up, it was something which perhaps psychologically or subconsciously, I had been hearing from parents and other people that the future should be in medicine. And I ended up pursuing that to a degree. I uh, graduated from Yale with a degree in engineering and applied science, but I also did pre-med. And during my years there, one night a week, I volunteered at Yale New Haven Hospital in the emergency room, which was really quite a, a great experience. So I thought this is what I should be doing, either medicine or biomedical engineering. When I graduated, I applied to medical school, about five, six, seven in the U.S., and didn't get into any of them. Never really understood why or why not, but all of a sudden, an opportunity came up to study in Paris, medicine, at a Beauchamp Port Royal, one of the major medical schools in Paris. I had some French. I went over early and got my French up to fluency and studied for a year in French, totally enjoyed the environment, the people, even some of the studies. But while alone, meaning apart from my support network and the comfort that I had growing up in the U.S., 
I began to wonder, is it really me who wants to be a doctor or am I trying to live out the dreams or the hopes of others? Mm -hmm. So I would say one of the key moments in my life and the seed for who I have become was that time in Paris where I began to realize, what do I really want? And that led to me making some additional changes. Mm -hmm. I've talked before in the podcast on time ago about the experience of learning medicine. If you're learning, you know, we are English native speakers, you still learn more new words in a medical degree in English than somebody learning a language degree. I think I read somewhere that you learn 15,000 new words in a five-year medical training, which is about 10 a day for five years straight. To do that in a language that is not your native language feels quite extraordinary. Mm. Um, how did you manage? Because there's a level of fluency required to just talk to people, but there's a different level of fluency required to talk to a patient about something that's really mm. important to them. So what did that feel like, having to get yourself to that level of fluency in the language to be able to even train? Well, as you say, the level of fluency, meeting new friends, making new friends, enjoying my time was less difficult than assimilating the technical jargon of medicine in French. Um, the thing is, the first year of medical school in Paris, in France, is, is mainly or a sponge, and you're receiving information. You're not having to share that other than on exams, written exams. So it wasn't as if I was doing rounds with a doctor and interacting with patients. It was very much one way, taking it in and spitting it out when you had to in tests, exams, and quizzes, and so on. So that part wasn't difficult. But it, it's hard for me now to think of all the things I learned in physics, in chemistry, in biochemistry, in anatomy, and I'm including my years at university, and now I don't remember any of this. <laughs> Your brain is an amazing organ. Uh, it took so much in, advanced calculus and math and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, which I was doing, and now it's all gone. So, <laughs> you know, trying to help my grandson with his math becomes a, a job for me, so uh, <laughs> it, it's quite something. Digging into the deep realms of the cerebral cortex. Yes. I'm fascinated by moments. And do you remember anything about where you were when you had that realization that maybe I'm not doing this for myself, maybe I'm doing this for other people? It's hard to pinpoint that, but I, I do remember that one of the social activities was to play softball in the Bois de Boulogne with an, a group of Americans, mainly Marines from the U.S. Embassy, and a few other people. And afterwards, we'd go for drinks after the, the games and talking with some of them about what they did. And a few of them were business school graduates, not the Marines per se, but the others. And I said, geez, that sounds interesting what you do. So there was a growing interest in me that maybe I have a certain skill in quantitative analysis and understanding things. But would I really want to continue studying or do I really want to get out and work like they were doing? And secondly, whatever I do, I think I like to do it with people. Mm -hmm. I like talking with people, engaging with people and studying for another f f six, seven, eight years uh, to become a doctor. I wasn't sure that was going to lead me to a happy place. I think that really resonates with me, this idea that there are multiple paths to be happy. And I think that there's something about medical training, and there's other, other probably vocational training that's quite similar to this, that you don't look outside that path because everybody with you on that path is doing the same thing to the same end goal. And it can be quite a moment when you go, actually, I can lift my head up and see that there are other people who are also smart, who are also doing interesting things, solving interesting problems, working with people, but they do it just in a very, very different way. And I, I was at an event yesterday where I was talking to some senior leaders who are variously in transition. And we were talking about the idea that there doesn't just have to be one path to where you really want to get to. This is very true, Gary. I mean, when I started my career in Citibank as a young management trainee, if you will, we talked about career paths. And one of the truths that we've learned over time, as the contract between organizations and employees has changed, as the world has changed, is there's no such thing as that linear or clear career path. There's nothing wrong in taking side steps. There's nothing wrong with taking steps back even if, if it helps you be happy and learn new things. 
Um, what I'll add in on this part of the conversation is that I came back to the States after that year and met with a career advisor at Yale. It was a new department they set up, and they gave me two great pieces of advice. One was to use a book called What Color Is Your Parachute by Bull, and it's a classic now. I was one of the earlier users, and it had you walk through, if you were diligent enough, all kinds of exercise about who am I, what do I like doing, what do I not like doing, what do I need to do or understand, be happy, write your biography, write your epitaph, all of those exercises which have come into the the movement of helping people uh, understand themselves. But the other great piece of advice I got was, since I was privileged to know my classmates whose parents did interesting jobs, uh, whether they were lawyers or advertising or accounting or something else, ask if I could go meet with those parents for a half hour and ask them, you know, what, what it is that you do. And so I did. I saw six or seven of them. I called up my friends who helped me get in touch with their parents. And they were very kind. And I walked in and I asked very naive questions. When you come into the office, what do you do? Are you on the telephone? Do you do analysis? Do you write? Do you negotiate? Do you sell? Do you travel? Where do you travel? And, and that kind of led me to the past to corporate banking, which is a, you know, another story. But I realized in banking, I can do some of the things which I felt were my strengths and some of the areas which were of most interest to me. And I think that's a really interesting pivot, that shift to you went into the banking world and obviously became hugely successful and did a huge variety of different things, actually in a huge variety of different countries. When you think to, I was playing to my strengths, what stands out for you in terms of this was me doing something that I really love doing? What are some stories that you remember from that time in banking that really epitomizes that? This is where I want to be. Yeah, well, part of it was the people I met. I'm still in touch with several people who were in that early counting class, economics class, corporate finance class, which were taught by business school professors. Uh, we're still friendly. We still see one another, several of us. So the people was a good part of it. These are great people to work with, to be with. I was like a sponge because I had never learned these things. And I had a great trainer, a mentor in my early days, a man who's not with us any longer, but uh, he spent time with me and he taught me. So the learning and the development and the enjoyment came from just being a part of a team and using these skills, the analytical skills. It was largely a selling job. It was also the travel. I loved to get on airplanes and I was traveling to great clients in my first six years in New York, retail stores, supermarkets, fast food chains, it was an interesting group to work with because they were very visible. And so I would, on my leisure time, walk into a department store or a supermarket and start to look around and understand how well they were doing by the way the store was laid out and so on and so forth. So it was interesting, fascinating, and, and I just loved it. We, we talked before we started recording the podcast, and you were telling me about your connection into professional football, professional soccer. <laughs> Where does that fit in this journey? And would you ever have wanted to pursue a path to be the new Pelé or Beckenbauer? Well, that would have been difficult because I was a goalkeeper. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I played in high school and I actually went into soccer because I wanted to get into shape for basketball season. Another drive, perhaps along with the medicine drive, was that my dad had been a coach when I was born, he brought a baseball bat and a baseball to my bedside in the hospital. So maybe it was preordained that I'd get very active in sports and played Little League baseball in the U.S. and, and basketball. So when I got to high school or junior high, I went to the basketball coach and said, what should I do during the fall season to get in shape for basketball? And he said, I, well, if you're not going to play football, American football, which I decided not to do because I didn't want to get hurt. He said, you can do cross-country running or go out for the football soccer team. And I said, what position should I play? And he's because I know nothing about it. And he said, well, maybe you have good reflexes and hands. You can develop your hand-eye coordination. Go out for goalkeeper. I did, and that became a great success in high school. I 
actually appeared in Sports Illustrated magazine when we accomplished 16 straight shutouts. And that, I think, also helped me get into Yale, quite frankly. And I played at Yale for four years. First freshman year, you're not on the varsity in those days, and then three years on the varsity. And I achieved a certain level of success as all Ivy and all New England, named on some All-American teams. And I still hold, Gary, after 50 years, an Ivy League record of the most career saves. Wow. Which also tells you a little bit about how questionable our offense was. (laughs) (laughs) I was quite busy. Um, You took the opportunities offered to you, that's what I'm going to say. (laughs) But I was working at Citibank, and about 1978, I was going to these New York Cosmos soccer matches, Pele, Beckenbauer, Kinalia, even Cruyff at one stage. And my college coach was coaching one of the teams from San Diego. I met him after the match, and he said, Ken, would you be interested in coming out and playing with us in San Diego? I'm sure you could play on this team. So I took it very seriously uh, because I always wanted to be a professional athlete. I actually met a senior vice president in Citibank who said that if I took a leave of absence to try it, they would allow me to come back. So I worked out for three or four weeks, running around the reservoir in Central Park, getting in shape. And then I realized the time had passed and my career in the bank was moving along quite well. Mm -hmm. So I let the opportunity pass. Maybe one little regret I have in my life that I didn't take that chance. But there you go. It's interesting when people look back on those kind of moments and often feel a little tinge of regret. Is there something about if you'd gone into it and it hadn't turned out the way you wanted, and you also might have missed out on many of the other things that you got to do, if you had your time again, do you think you'd make the same decision with the benefit of hindsight? Yes, I, I th- because how well things have worked out, of course. And you're right that there was a moment at that point in time when I said to myself, maybe the dream is better than having tried and not succeeded. And the odds of my succeeding were not that great because I had been away from it for several years. So I I wasn't in competition mode, if you will. I got into great shape, but I hadn't played competitively for a number of years. And I just wondered whether I'd be able to do it. I might add that I might be redeeming my sense that it was important to me because I am talking to the captain of that team that played with Pele and Beckenbauer about writing a book together. And we've been uh, thinking about this for several months. And it will be about U.S. professional soccer and the personalities, coaches, players, executives who've helped develop and evolve the U.S. professional game to where it is now. So maybe that's my way of accepting that that didn't happen, but I can still have a, a touch point to U.S. professional sports. We'll see how it goes. I really like that. Where in the story are the exploding turkeys and the spare trousers? Where does that come in? During COVID, having been fortunate to join a group called 100 Coaches, which was established by Marshall Goldsmith, 18,000 people have applied for position in this community. And over time, about 400 have been chosen. And it's been a wonderful, supportive, positive group for learning, for development, and for sharing and supporting each other. And during COVID, some of us, particularly based in Europe, got together and started to put posts on LinkedIn. And the idea was that we would post at the same time during one hour, we called it the hour of learning power. And we would comment on each other's posts, uh, not only to learn from each other and support one another, but rather cynically maybe to game the system (laughs) because we thought that would improve through the viewership based on the algorithm of LinkedIn. And I began to write stories about my adventures. I really didn't know what to write. And it was my daughter who said, Dad, when you're lecturing, when you're teaching, when you're speaking, you're always telling war stories about the times in Turkey or in China or in the Middle East or wherever. And why don't you just share some of those? So I began to write them. In the early days, if you remember, we we were limited to 1,300 characters. So it was a very interesting writing experience. But for each story, I then decided to put at the bottom a lesson, a lesson about life or 
business? What did I learn from this? And what could others take away from it? And having done 10, 15 of those, the group, it was, it was, they were receiving great reviews, widely seen, and the group was saying, why don't you put these into a book? So I took those and I added more stories and I found a publisher in the UK. And I must admit it was the publisher who came up with the title, Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers, Adventures in Global Business. And the Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers relates to two of the stories in the book. The book reflects interesting people I've met, exciting adventures I've had around the world. And, and, and I say, I hope some of the lessons can be relevant and useful for people who read the book. It's 53 one-page stories, and it's in a small pocketbook, uh, so it's easy just to carry on an airplane. I always thought it was a great airplane reading book. Fantastic. Well, give us the essence of the exploding turkeys. I'd love to hear that story. The exploding turkeys, I'll tell you this one. Uh, my wife and I and the kids, we moved to Istanbul for a project which was a very interesting project. And we thought that first November, we would have a Thanksgiving dinner, very American, you know, very secular. And I invite a lot of the people that we had met since we had been there about six months. We also, at the time, had taken on a maid to work with us during the day. We had a one-year-old daughter, and our son was 12. He was going to school. My wife also, I co-opted to work with me on the project which was to turn a dilapidated hotel into a world-class residential training center for the Turkish Bankers Association. It was a major, major undertaking, and I was way out of my comfort zone, but never led on to that. I act, tried to act as if I knew what I was doing. <laughs> my wife did the interiors, and I did overall project planning, working with the contractors, the architects, and also, of course, designing the curriculum and hiring staff. So the maid was there to, to work with Harriet. My wife went with Aisha to the butcher to order turkeys, but my wife didn't know the name of turkey in Turkish. So she ordered several büyük tavukla, which large chickens. And the day came for the party. She brought the chickens home. We dressed them. We put them in the oven. And as we're hearing them cook, all of a sudden we hear explosions, loud explosions. And what we realized had happened is the butcher had injected water underneath the skin of the chickens to make them seem larger. As the water under the skin boiled, the chickens were exploding. And that was the exploding turkeys. Now, the the side of the story, which is really interesting that I included, is that a few weeks later, we finally learned what Aisha's surname was. And her surname was Hindi. And when we ask what Hindi means, we learn that it's the Turkish word for turkey. (laughs) So the answer was always there right in front of us, but we just had never known Aisha Hanum's surname and could have learned the word for turkey very easily. That's the (laughs) story. I love that story. Now, a big part of your career, particularly more recently, has been associated with the world of Formula One. Tell me how you first got into the Formula One environment, the Formula One world. Well, you know, living in Finland at several points in my life, and at that time, I was not a big Formula One fan, even though Finland had some great drivers, Keke Roseberry, Mika Hakkinen, and a few others. Kimi Raikkonen was developing at that time. But I had just finished three years working with Ford Motor Company, doing action learning with very senior level of the organization. And someone, when I finished that, after three years of doing these projects, said, you must know something about cars and motorsport. Can you perhaps help us with this assignment? And the assignment was to work for a major law firm based in London, an international law firm, one of the top five, six in the world. And the brief was to teach their lawyers business acumen. And the way they wanted us to do that was to do a workshop where they learn about business. And they suggested, because some of the partners were Formula One fans, can you take Formula One and shape that into a learning experience? So I was teamed up with two other people who are the two co-authors of the book that we wrote, Performance at the Limit. One was a professor of strategy at Cranfield School of Management and one of the authorities on motorsport from a business point of view. And the other had been the commercial director for two of the Formula One teams the job where you go out and get the sponsorship. The three of us created a role play simulation. 
And over two days, I played that I was the vice president of strategy for Volkswagen, trying to consider how to enter Formula One under the Audi brand. Volkswagen, because they were a client of the law firm, and Audi, because we thought that would be the logical brand that would enter into Formula One. And at that time, 20 years ago, BMW was in, Honda was in, Toyota was in, Jaguar was in. So it seemed like the thing that was going to happen. Ironically, Audi will come in in 2026 to Formula One finally. (laughs) It was a great success, Gary. We ran the program 50 times over three years, covering 1,200, 1,500 of their lawyers. And when we finished, Mark and Richard came up to Helsinki, actually, on a summer's day, and we drank a lot of white wine sitting at my porch of my summer house, looking over the Baltic Sea, and decided, let's write a book. Because we had learned so much about the parallels of the business of Formula One, leadership, teamwork, communication, creating a winning culture, continual learning, and so on. And so the book came together quite easily. In fact, we got great support from Bernie Eccleston, who was running Formula One, to do interviews We went to several Formula One races and got paddock passes, so we were able to go and do interviews in the motorhomes. And that's how the book came out in 2005. And by then, in a sense, I was an expert about Formula One. I knew the people. I understood the background, some of the technology. But it was was just a great experience. And I began to do programs, and I still do programs half-day, one-day, two-day programs using the the, the basis of the book to talk about teamwork, leadership, communication, and so on and so forth. As you said earlier, the book in 2007, we worked with the BBC to make an eight-part series, which paralleled some of the stories in the book, and they added others. 2009, we did a second edition because regulations changed, teams changed. And 2016, we did a third edition. Again, interviewing a lot more people, new people in, into the sport. And the book has been translated into Japanese, into Turkish, and into uh, Mandarin Chinese. So it, it has legs. It's still a great story. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed talking about it. And I was reading a recent article that you had written about the parallels between Formula One and leadership and business. And something that struck me was There are lots of really great principles of good leadership and good teamwork that are absolutely demonstrated in Formula One, but they're not necessarily distinctive or unique to Formula One. They are just demonstrated in Formula One. But what do you think are things that are demonstrated in Formula One that really are distinctive? One of the things you've written about is this idea of performance at the limit. What makes the Formula One environment such a good example of leadership and teamwork in action? Well, Formula One is a regulated, hyper-competitive business. And they just completed 24 races during this past season, flying across time zones where people are stretched to the limits of their capabilities, physically and mentally. And I'm not just talking about the drivers, and that's a whole other story where you can learn to understand the pressures that these guys are under. But everyone else is under that pressure. To deliver a pit stop of two seconds or even less takes coordination, it takes physical capability, it takes focus for guys. And that's not their only job. Their day job is as mechanics and engineers to get the car ready and to get it out there. So it's very hard to find another industry where the competitors, meaning the whole team, are working at that heightened level of awareness and attention. And it's not just the people who are going to the races. At the factory, they're working that hard as well. And some of these teams, you know, have 800, 1,000 people working to get that car going around the circuit as quickly as possible. So it's that pressure and that competitiveness, which I think is remarkable for Formula One. And talk to me about the mindset of the driver and then the mindset of the people in the team behind them to be able to sustain and deliver at that kind of extreme level of performance. Well, you know, it's evolved over time. It's not the drivers of 20, 30 years ago who would smoke and drink beer and then get in the car and drive around. All the drivers are highly engaged athletes, and they all have performance coaches helping them become physical specimens as well as on the mental side, dealing with the pressures. 
They have nutrition regimes. They have regimes to help them deal with jet lag as they cross the world. So it's not taken for granted that to drive with the focus that you need to drive at 300 kilometers per hour in uh, in machines that are like rocket ships, you need to be on your game all the time. So the mental side of this is extremely important. It's like in other professional sports, in tennis, where at the top levels, they're all great athletes, they're all great tennis players, but some seem to carry a mental strength and a focus, an ability to to find the right strength at the right time. And great drivers do that as well. The other part of this is the rivalry between the two drivers who are on the same team. Of the 10 teams, every team has two cars and two drivers. They're competing as a team, but they're also competing against each other. And if I can do a small plug for my friend Ross Braun, who was one of the greats in Formula One, uh, there's a great documentary on Disney Plus right now about the remarkable 2009 season when Braun F1 won the championship. And why it's particularly remarkable is the insights you get into the two drivers. If you're interested in that, I'd highly recommend it. Fantastic. And when you've been doing this work over the last few years with the drivers, with the engineers, with the teams, have you reflected differently on your own path and your own choices based on seeing these people working in the way that they do? In a way, yes. I, 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 it's a good question because I hadn't reflected on it specifically, but I've chosen a path in my life where my balance between family and friends and my work has been more important to me than making money, for example. And I've been fortunate to do well enough to have a nice lifestyle, but I've often chosen family ahead of business opportunities. And when I look at the Formula One teams, these people have very, very tough lifestyles, very hard to maintain family and relationships if you're traveling around the world the way you do work the hours the way you have to work. So in that sense, seeing how hard they work and the sacrifices they've made have given me some perspective on the choices I've made to live a lifestyle which allows me to enjoy the fruits of my labors and not just the labors, if you will. It's very interesting. I was talking to another guest recently, Vicky Sato. She's a senior biotech and pharma executive, now has a role in the White House. And she was talking about this idea of balance, as you described. And she said, I hear a lot of people complaining that they don't have enough balance, but I don't hear that many people saying that balance in and of itself is a goal that they're aiming for in the way they intentionally design their life. And I think sometimes when people think about balance, they think about an easy balance. But actually, for super high performers, Balance doesn't mean life is easy. It's just they've got things exactly where they want it to be. You know, you've had a time in your life where you were intentionally traveling extensively around the world and working on huge projects. And, you know, the Formula One teams are working at right at the limit. Mm. But they're doing it because it's exactly what they want to be doing. So what's your perspective on how you find this place where you go, I am in balance. I've, I've got that mix of things that I want and I'm not. So many people are saying to me right now, they're saying, I just feel like I'm running on this hamster wheel and I don't have time or headspace to stop and figure out really Mm. how I want to be shaping my life. Well, first thing I would say is I tend not to use the word balance in real life. I I use the word harmony Mm. because I, I think it's trying to harmonize your ambitions in terms of accomplishing things, whether it's playing sports or in business life or teaching children with the other parts of our lives, which are either equally important or not, depending upon how you feel about things. So it's not making a judgment about people who work 80 or 90% of the time and don't spend as much time with their family or friends as others, but you're making a choice. And everyone should be doing this consciously. I just finished reading the autobiography of Indra Nooyi, who headed up PepsiCo, And, you know, she had some very difficult times during her life to reach that pinnacle of success. And a lot had to do with the trade-offs and harmonies that she had to find with her children, her husband, and family. And it's an interesting read to see what sacrifices she had to make and how hard she had to work. My wife is a very smart person, and we're fortunate to have four grandchildren, ages 7 to 13 now. 
And when the oldest was born, she said to me, you love being with your grandchildren. You, you will love that and because she, she knows me so well. And she saw me with the first grandchild and how, how I acted and wanted to be with her. She said, during the first 10 years of their lives, you as grandpa, you are a superhero. They want to be with you. They want to learn from you. You want to have fun with you and you the same with them. When they reach the age of 10, they're going to have other friends. They're going to have their clubs. They're going to have activities. And they'll love you. And they'll want to see you from time to time. But, and so she said to me, you travel. You love what you're doing. But when they grow up, as we saw with our children, it happens so fast. Do you want to miss out on those years and that chance to bond and be with them? And fortunately, all of our, our kids and our grandkids live in Helsinki almost within walking distance from us. So I already made a decision. I opted to make a choice 10, 12 years ago that I would work less. I would travel less, work just as hard when I'm working. And of course, as things evolved, we began to deliver more virtually, which made it easier to be around. And COVID certainly helped us to be around. But I realized it was more important that I spend these important years bonding with my grandchildren and enjoying that time than continuing to travel and do the things I was doing. So I reduced my travel activity deliberately. And that's how I felt very comfortable with the choices I've made. I love that idea of an intentional pursuit of harmony. If you were to be able to jump back in time and meet, I don't know, the teenage version of yourself, the teenage Ken, and Knowing what you know now, give that person a bit of life advice. What would you say to Ken in his teenage years? I've thought about this before. I, I think I was very privileged to go to a great private high school and to go to Yale. I was always open-minded, but I think I was a bit judgmental. And I don't know why, but I was open-minded to the friends I had, the things I did. But I also think that perhaps I was too easily deciding on what was right, what was wrong, what was good, what was bad. And, and I learned over time that things aren't black and white. They're much more gray than that. So the advice I would give is relax a little bit if you can. Of course, at those years, we're pursuing our chance to get into good colleges and performing and all this. But maybe relax a little bit more and, and, and just accept things a little bit more. I think that's great. That's great life advice. And I reflect, I reflect back on myself at a similar age. And I think, yeah, I should probably listen to that advice too. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Ken, how can people find out more about you and the work that you do? I have a website, uh, www.kppasternak.com. And I've had three books, as you kind of suggest, Performance at the Limit, Business Lessons from Formula One. The book we've been talking about as well, Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers. I also wrote a book some 20 years ago, I co-authored a book called Managing Your Strengths, about one approach to improving your interpersonal skills using what's called the life orientations method. And I can be reached through my website and happy to talk with people and uh, share ideas and learn from each other. Fantastic. The Unlock Moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. For educator, speaker, author, and consultant Ken Pasternak, it was figuring out that he was pursuing medicine for others, not for himself, that set him on a fascinating path that took him around the world to become a world-leading expert on performance at the limit. Find his latest book, Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers, Adventures in Global Business, on Amazon and at all great bookstores. Ken, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Unlock Moment. Thank you very much, Gary. I've enjoyed it very much. If you've enjoyed this conversation with its stories from a fascinating career journey, then check out episode 77 with expert in horrible bosses, Todd Churches. And if you resonated with how Ken pursued harmony in life and work, then check out episode 53 on grace under pressure with John Baldoni and episode 36 for my memorable conversation with Dr. Marshall Goldsmith on the earned life. Bookmark these episodes for later. This has been The Unlock Moment, a podcast with me, Dr. Gary Crotez. Thank you for listening in. You can find out more about how to figure out what you want and how to get it in my book, The Idea Mindset. 
find me on Instagram at Dr. Gary Crotez, and subscribe to this podcast to get notified about future episodes. Most listeners to this podcast on Apple and Spotify haven't yet hit the follow button. If there's one thing you can do right now to help me out, then please click the follow button. The more followers I have, the better guests I can attract for you to learn from. Thanks again for listening and join me again soon here on the Unlock Moment.